recording. Um, so hello everyone, welcome to Digital Demos for a special edition, trip down memory lane back to when your Viz2 class was originally called Technics of Communication. Ooh. Uh, you know, going through uh, my old final portfolio. Uh, so here we have this wonderful uh, opening spread that just says Technics Spring 2017 Portfolio. Um, and as we go through, if it, there we go. And big old font, design one, keeping those categories. Um, source of light with a single picture. We have the drawings, two images side by side with text not totally centered on the page and also justified right. Um, <laughs> series of six images. Um, I don't really know what I was doing with that text over there. Hey, some good process, but like good process, everything yep. is lined up. Everything kind of is like fitting within an overall scheme because the other it's got the content in it. Right. Which and is like, what was important. Yeah. And having like a very, a very simple basic layout so that you could keep, like you can make all the projects look like they're supposed to hang together. You know, mm -hmm. you were super proud of this perspective <laughs> and you should have been as first year, you should have been. I mean, this was before 3D modeling. Yeah. Uh, I don't, do you know the context behind this? I don't remember why I put all these sevens. Now you were it was weird. definitely uh, a joke. It was, you were a weird It's freshman. page seven. I mean, seven is my favorite number, so I'm assuming that's why. It's an in-joke. It's an in-joke because we weren't using lorem ipsum yet, and so I had you guys fill up stuff um, to, to prove that it's really important to have text, and I think you filled every page seven with sevens the entire semester. All right. That's what cool. I think. <laughs> well, here's page seven, the most important page, obviously. Um, and just moving on to uh, going through the projects, the old site, Oof, these old drawings. There's actually some of my best uh, hand drawings that I ever did. Yeah, and a lot of editing in Photoshop to make the white, the white space kind of just disappear into the project. We've gone over mm -hmm. that. All the Viz faculty have. I'm gone pretty over sure when editing these, I also spend the time to like trace them out and replace the background. Yeah. Um, because when the picture was taken, the uh, poche didn't go through too well. Right. Right. And that's that's. I mean, it's things like that are really important because these are look at it, these are really good drawings. And to show that this is where you came from as a first year student, even in a professional portfolio to see what you did as a freshman and how far you come gives a really good impression to your employer what you're capable of right like how flexible you are how how malleable how willing you are to challenge yourself like this section model of a model right it cracks mm -hmm. in half yeah fun fact you know don't plan out your section models early so you don't have to take a jigsaw to them uh halfway through the project and take it by your model to get it done <laughs> that was awesome uh, blank page for transition right. into right. Mondo. And that's, and that's okay to do. It's okay to have a blank page on purpose. And by doing that, it gives you this moment of break between one project and the next. So oh, Mondo. Can... This is uh, uh, Mondo. What a fun project. Stuck a mirror in a box. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, another blank page, the vis oh, visitor center. This is my spaceship. Where's the, pi where's the pylon in that project? Sadly. Unfortunately, there is no pylon in this project. There should be. I wish. Oh, and now we get to the good stuff, though. So this is what Viz2 used to be. The bridge project. These, yeah. Everybody, Mary and Jessica and Brenna and Will were the first class that didn't have to do the bridge project. Oh, you guys are lucky. Oh, no. They, no went, they went to Center City instead. Oh, and special appearance from uh, Ryan McMahon doing the legendary heel tap on the bridge. Excellent. Fun fact, this has been like a scale figure in like most of Sal's renderings since. Are you serious? <laughs> you go through my old presentations, like, Ryan is like in there somewhere shoved into every single rendering. So there's the proof in the pudding. So I was just going over scale figures with my biz class. And I was saying, if you make a good fail scale figure, it can keep showing up. And you can keep using them. And there's, there you go. There it is right there. I also have one of Ryan laying on a tree um, that I also use as a scale figure. It's that one right, right over here, other Ryan. Um, and then 
we go down to a uh, meme bridge of all the great 2016 memes plus Ryan. There was so much that you had to learn. So, so much. The way Sorry. you've grown. Yeah. <laughs> right. Ryan, is the fo- are the photographs of Sal and Olivia and Sal and Olivia, is that you for a final? Wait, what's keeps, up? The photographs that are showing up on IG, are, the, are they, is that, who's the photography major? That's oh, yeah. The, yeah, that's, that's, that's me. you. Yeah. So you're getting revenge, bridge style. <laughs> yeah, bridge style. <laughs> um, and we have the monograph. All right. I remember also thinking that this was like the best section I ever made. Mm-hmm. Um, these are good. I still have this. Very young Patrick. And then the old, yep, Bob Steiner. So that that's so that's Bob Steiner. Go back one slice. So anybody who's a freshman, so we used to go to Bob's Diner, but because of social distancing, Bob's Diner can't accommodate us. And so instead, you guys did a CAD map of a neighborhood in Philadelphia and another city. So. This is one of those ways to make a CAD map show up. Now, CAD default, the background is black, but you can see that it's really helpful to, at the very least, switch the background to white so that it can just kind of sit on your portfolio and look like a drawing. Having that black background can be really um, distracting. And when you print it out, the black ink kind of bleeds in and kind of ruins the, the image. But you can just see that like, so, Sal, what do you think about this uh, AutoCAD drawing now? Um, It's a total mess of stuff, um, but only because it's like really packed with information. Um, And even now I can still kind of remember what like some of the layers and lines were um, and kind of what they were showing. This is a pancake breakfast, right? Yeah. So we have the uh, maple syrup super highway, and I think you can see people who's right and left-handed chewing on pancakes. I'm trying to remember if somebody spilled stuff. I think that might have been the afternoon class. There was uh, the Setch books. Yeah. Uh, that were laid around. There's all of these hexagons are like people just kind of moving around in their chairs. Um, there's a bunch of stuff where I think just like utensils moving around and stuff too, all the different plates. Um, and you can clearly tell that this is where Andrew and Ryan Allsop were sitting, and this is where the rest of the class uh, was that's sitting. Right. Uh, yeah, that's I right, was Ryan. sitting right here. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was over here. Yep. Our our table was well behaved. Totally. Um. <laughs> so what I will say though is is that. What's interesting about this project is that the, oh, and that other image is actually AutoCAD imported to Illustrator. So on, yeah. Right? Exploring brushes and tools. So here's what I'm going to say is that, that they, these images, there's this very interesting thing about human space is that it's scalar. And so whether you're doing a neighborhood, and uh, I know my Viz class, we called it um, Cheese Whiz space because it was the area where you could smell the Cheese Whiz just from Pats and Geno's. Um, there's, there's this scalar possibility of the space. And so there's this density when you start drawing lots of lines that you start getting this richness and then you can, and then you can start, you know, blowing your horn whenever you feel like, you know, it's time to bring it and you just do it. So it's a very beautiful image, kind of unleashed energy, not necessarily rigor, but rigor and passion are important to have. And it takes a while to bring the two together. Sorry, I think this is the one image in here that I'm like still impressed with like what yeah. I've done. It was fearless. And that's what I love about beginning design students is that you guys don't know how to mess up. And so you make beautiful things. Um, um, this is the last slide. All right. Diner space. And, uh, Very cool. C milling. Shall we slide over to, um, and, and I got to say for everybody who is a freshman, if you feel like you got to miss out on Bob's Diner and CNC milling, do not worry. We are going to make up for it second year. I promise you. And for second year students who are bummed that you missed out on both of those, you'll just have to come and join us from third year. Okay. Like you're, you're all invited. Bob's Diner is great. Bob's Diner is a bastion of our university off-campus culture. So Olivia, do you want to share yours? 
Uh, so I, the portfolio that I found was from, um, I forgot what Viz it was at the time versus what it is now. Viz 3? Uh, is it Viz 3? Yeah. Then Viz 2? That's okay. Go ahead. Okay, but I kind of want to see what I, what I did for this Viz class. So All right. can we see that one? <laughs> I'll look for it. I'll look for it. I'll look for okay. it. So you share this one. I'll look for your old one. Sounds good. Um, oh, I think I accidentally, oh, crap. I just delete, uh, not deleted it, X out of it. <laughs> Somebody actually doesn't want to share their stuff. I'm no, kidding. I'm, I'm trying to. <laughs> okay, here we go. Where is my Zoom? There it is. Okay, so here is my Viz portfolio from the fall of 2017. Um, I thought I was being really cool here with this like black background with like lines through it. Um, so yeah, um, table of contents was really into, uh, century Gothic as a font as at the time. <laughs> yes, you were. Yes, you were. I still use it to be honest. So it's, it's, it's good. It's dapper. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a project I did over the summer after my freshman year at one of the firms I was working at. Um, so it was like a little like installation. I ended up winning first place, um, not because the design was good, but I'm pretty sure none of the employees wanted to come in an extra weekend to uh, build this. Uh, hey, <laughs> it was, it, this is the most simple one, but I was, yeah, I think it was a good presentation, but anyway, Looking at this spread, I'm just like, wow, we got this floating thing in space and these random trees. Yeah, but let's, but I mean, let's look at it from the point of view of where you were at, right? Like you've organized, so we're looking at a spread, right? So it would be stapled in the middle right now is where right. it would be. And so we've got a perspective over on the left with some scalar uh, entourage which for a first year student to put in trees like that is, is, is a reach, right? And because these are probably some of the first trees that you tried to make in Entourage. And then to put those scale figures in, we have a, you went, you decided to go big on your elevation. The mm -hmm. detail is very simple, but you're at least thinking about it in detail, which a lot of first years are not necessarily doing. We're just going to put them together with magic glue. At the very least, there's two arrows that stick this together. <laughs> and and there's an and there's a, a computer model that's here too in 3D. So and you haven't been in Viz yet, Viz three, and you haven't been in 3D modeling yet. So right. So again, like it's not about having a kick-ass portfolio. It's about like this is the first step on saying this is who I think I am, and you need to be able to take that stuff back and say I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna change the type of sneakers I wear. Right. That's okay. I just love how the scale figure here is going to like hit his head. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little flat. It's a little tough to see the depth. Yeah. 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 But you got the trees in front of it. And hey, is that actually it? Yeah. So, so I wasn't there for the build. They ended up building it without me because I had to go back to school. Wow. Um, so these are actual renderings I did for it at the time. Not bad. And this is what it turned out to be. Not and bad. They built one of the other proposals too. Um, but as like a, I think I still do this like in my portfolios as like a sort of spread, like when I'm showing either model photos or um, like for the synesthesia project, I did like the same thing, kind of like a line of images across both spreads at the same, you know, height, make sure they're all, you know, lining up and stuff. So I think this is a good spread. Totally. I, it's a great way of, it's a great way of collecting a bunch of images that don't necessarily go together, but by lining up the text and the images with an overarching strategy, it makes them feel like they can fit together. Mm -hmm. And I just want to point out to everybody that one of the differences that we're seeing here, Sal's was also a portfolio that you could flip through, but we looked at it one page at a time. That's an option when you're in InDesign. You can tell it to print one page at a time. For Olivia's, we're looking at it as if it's open two pages at a time. And that's also valuable. There is no right or wrong way between the two. It's kind of about the experience that you want to have. And so like 
a lot, Sal, the reason why you had a lot of blank pages was because there might be an illustration on the left and you needed that empty space on the right so that your new project was starting fresh. Yeah, all the uh, white pages were kind of just spacers to make sure exactly. that the next project had its own spread. Exactly. Whereas like Olivia has chosen to do this as a spread and this one, oh, that's beautiful. That's fantastic, right? Because we get this entire experience of this kind of laid out linear. And because it's not, this is very important. It's not a presentation. It's not a design review, right? It's something to flip back and forth between to just get a feel. The cool thing about a portfolio, and we'll talk about it even more with the process book. The cool thing about a portfolio is that it's not about any one particular project. It's just about, oh man, it's just about kind of showing how you made it. Olivia, can you go back one page? Because this is a really nice story. How you came up with it, how you made the model. And this is where like just taking some beautiful photographs of a cheesy cardboard model can make it look beautiful. This is really nice. Can you just explain this project into the next one a little bit? Because there will still be a version of this next okay. semester. So this is a D3 project and it was the first project of the semester. Basically the assignment is you have a, it says here a 12 inch by 36 inch piece of cardboard and you have to cut and score it and fold it. Um, all, all one piece of cardboard, you can't like cut a piece out of it and then glue it on somewhere else. Like all has to kind of like come and like fold in on itself and come together to become like a piece of architecture. And then you add like mullions and stairs and things to kind of like make it suggest more of um, that piece of architecture. Um, and so that was the design three project. And then we took that project in Viz and uh, learned how to render. So we had to build not only the physical model, but also learning how to build the Rhino model, which is how I got these diagrams here. And then um, in Andrew's class, we uh, did a lot of Photoshop. So um, Photoshopping materials onto uh, the building. Uh, maybe I could zoom in on these. And this like, is just like, this is this is the version of the row house project that happened in 2017. We've now switched neighborhoods into a different neighborhood and we kind of follow the vernacular architecture a little bit more, but it's the same type of learning style. And just like now, all the biz professors teach a slightly different way of rendering. What is it doing here? I'm just trying to move. <laughs> I, I actually still really like this rendering. I, you know, there's, because, and here's the, here's the thing, like I said, the thing that I love about beginning design students is their fearlessness. They don't know the way they're supposed to do it. And so you guys end up discovering some really unique ways that only you will do it. And you end up carrying it with you forward. And, and Olivia, I still see your hand in your imagery when you do stuff like this. And I think that's always really cool because we can trace it back to you kind of bumping into it here. Mm -hmm. It's very right. cool. This this right hand side um, is basically an explanation of how the rendering came together. So it's kind of like if you took all the layers of your Photoshop file and exploded them uh, to see all the parts and pieces that make up the image. Um, so this is another D3 project, uh, which was my row home. Um, which I really like how I included these sketches, but as a spread, I am not so much liking it. <laughs> I mean, I think for I think for second year, it's respectable, right? Yeah. Because you guys actually we did we took a lot longer on this project. You guys had a very short amount of time to take that folded model and convert it into a row house. This is kind of the first piece of architecture on a real site that you guys had to do. Mm -hmm. And but I actually think taking really good high res scans or photos of your sketches and blowing them up can be an excellent way to show how you can be facile with multiple tools. And I think that's that, that translates to a very real, very viable uh, message to employers, to yourself, that all of these modes are, are valuable. You yeah. could have made that, you could have made these volume diagrams in Rhino, but you didn't because it was faster to draw it. So why not? Yeah, that's something good to, to note. Like in my current portfolio, I do have actual hand-drawn sketches. And one of the comments I got from one of my interviews at Design Expo was that they were like really glad to see that 
you know, Absolutely. hand sketching is still a part of the design process. Um, because you know what? People are still drawing over stuff in Miro, drawing over stuff in Zoom, drawing on post-it notes and holding it up in front of cameras. It's an invaluable design skill. Right. And you'll see that this is just 13 spreads. So it's 26 pages um, of images. And here's another example of moving between the 3D and the, oh man, the cabin. <laughs> and going between three dimensions, right? Um, physical and analog. And you actually intersperse them with each other to show that it's not all about one or the other. It's about just showing how you can use many tools. I think that's the other thing that's really important about portfolios, especially portfolios, is that I can use many tools. You can teach me to do many things. How can I be of assistance on this team? It's not, look at how cool I am, because that's going to change as you mature. But showing how, how hungry you are to learn, that's always valuable. Uh, nice to so get the raw rendering here and stuff. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Olivia. <laughs> that's all good. Uh, so this is the cave cabin competition. So I think this still... This still happens, right? This still happens. This yeah. still happens. Um, so basically, like the project was you you choose a cabin, you build it in Rhino. So like it's how you learn a way to learn how to uh, use Rhino and then going in and rendering and learning how to create a competition board. Um, and so like it was really cool to kind of like get creative with how to do the rendering. So like this one, I remember having a conversation with you, Andrew. I was like, how do I have like two renderings, like one show, like the interior and exterior, yada, yada. And oh, I remember like, it clearly. What if you were in the inside looking to the outside? And I was like, like mind blown. <laughs> so, um, well, and your skill figures, you were had you had all these people, but you really wanted to have dogs. And I was like, just make the skill figure the dog. Where's the dog going to be? And you're like, on the bed. And I was like, well, then put it on the bed. And you're like, I can't, can I do that? And I was like, Olivia, <laughs> of course you can do that. Yeah, this is so funny because like I'm looking at this now and um, at Andrew's review uh, the other day, one student had a detail um, that I was like, why don't you just make it part of the drawing? And like, that's what I kind of tried to do that here where the detail of sort of like the foundation and the column coming into the actual rendering. Yeah. And then we go into the last project of d3 all right who do you have for d3 olivia griffin griffin nice i did enjoy the studio <laughs> who did you have who did you well as a big building it was a really big building i don't think anybody likes the big building at the end of d3 i don't i don't know brenna what do you think about the big building at the end of d3 a little intimidating um i do not remember it <laughs> the, for us it was the community center okay yeah it's a little intimidating to do a big building your first time yeah definitely it's all good it's all good but look olivia you're still using the same uh theme that you've set for the entire portfolio show some <laughs> drawings and then show a medley or a mix of model and computer and you can kind of like, if there's a model drawing that you're not that proud of, you can make it smaller. If there's one that you're really proud of, you make it bigger. And you just kind of use this invisible grid to line everything up to just kind of make it feel like it fits together like a newspaper. Right. Hey, and there's even a tech project in there. Yeah. <laughs> nice. I think um, something I would definitely say about like what the difficult part about portfolios is uh, figuring out how to edit down your stuff because yeah. you know a project you do so much there's so much like from beginning to end and um understanding how to it's not always about showing like the final like this is the best thing like it's nice to show some like process in between there but like figuring out what were the really important key drawings or models etc that really explain uh you as a designer or or your or the story of your project that's an, that is a superb point. And I think that's the difference right there between a process book and a portfolio. The portfolio is highly curated. You do not have to put in anything that you think is ugly. Whereas a process book is not something you're gonna take to an interview. A process book is to show to you and your faculty member, 
look how far I've come. Mm -hmm. So a portfolio is, this is who I am and what I'm capable of. This is the learning that I can do. This is what I can, this is what, this is me to the outside world, as well as a little bit to yourself. Cause I think every portfolio is a little bit of a autobiography process book is the kind of nitty gritty that shows some of the ugly, some of the dead ends, you know, tell some of the behind the scenes. It's kind of like the, the, the good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> exactly. Right. Right. It shows the kind of most interesting learning stuff, which always, which isn't always the prettiest, right? It's like the sticky notes all over stuff. It's where you learn the most. It kind of, it's proof of learning. Whereas the portfolio is the product of learning. And so, <laughs> Hey, I have, I have Olivia Biratiri freshman portfolio, 40 pages long, by the oh way. <laughs> um, so let me just click here so I can see if I can get, uh, we're going to have to scroll down. Portfolio 2016, 2017. So this is interesting because you divide it up into chapters with little thumbnail images of each of your projects. Yep. And then a blank page. I got that off of, I saw it on Google Images. I was like, portfolio cover page. And I saw something. I was like, oh, I'll do something like that. <laughs> nothing wrong. Nothing wrong with that. Because this is everybody's first portfolio. Tons of students like to have this. I. It doesn't matter to me. But a lot of students think that, find this is, I think it's helpful to yourself as you're setting it out. That it's helpful to kind of give yourself a um, table of contents. This is all in InDesign, by the way. Um, InDesign merges really well with Miro because you can download images from Miro, put them in folders, and then use InDesign to place them in a very similar graphic user interface as Miro. And then you can always package the file and it creates a PDF and it creates a linked file and an archive. I highly recommend it. And if what I said is at all confusing, just hit F1, any Adobe product, hit F1 and that's, that's the help for you. So, wow, we've got some D1 projects here. Ran out of time to do a little bit of editing on that background there. And you can see Olivia's like, no. <laughs> right? So going in here, you can fix that with the levels. I don't think I even thought to do it, Andrew. I don't think there was even like I ran out of time. I was it's, just like. <laughs> it's, it's invisible to some people. But, you know, just doing, and you can see it's kind of going with this gray tone here. But you just go into levels. Control L in Photoshop. You can, if you have this in InDesign, you can say open, edit with Photoshop. Control L for levels and just set the white to a white levels and black. You can even go more into it further. Um, Sal and Brenna can direct people to the digital demo that we have called Quick Photoshop Tricks. It's our most, our most watched uh, video and it'll show you how to clean up drawings. It takes, once you get good at it, it takes less than five minutes. So. Got some good photography here. Got some page numbers and they're always in the same spot. So you can see that these are designed in spread six and five. Here's the Falls Bridge. This is the version of the freshmen this year. We're out in Philadelphia. You guys were out in Philadelphia at the Falls Bridge. They were out in neighborhoods. Here's a drawing that you guys had to do of it. Viz one covers this now. So Viz two now doesn't have to cover this anymore. There we go, a little hand collage, a little analog Photoshop. A little actual, I remember this, a little actual Photoshop. <laughs> Olivia went in to Photoshop hard. And then a monograph on Sagrada Familia, which is basically practice to make a, uh, an, a, a portfolio. We didn't do a monograph. Instead, we did um, different, different um, viz sections, did different cities. So you could almost say that this is Olivia's uh, city um, mapping of Barcelona, Barcelona. Not gonna and, lie, I still really like this monograph. It fell apart, but <laughs> really, it's it's tough. It's very tough. But I love this because it's a it's an entree into detailing. Um, we couldn't do it this year. I know that the second years did it last year, and a bunch of them um, showed up on my via U.S. Postal Service. But we we didn't we we issued this this year in the promise that we'll get you guys this next. All right, there we go, testing it out in the library. And then drawings don't just have to be 2D, they can also be 3D and they can be found around the place. And there's that, there's, so you guys saw the same map from Sal. This is Olivia's version of the map. She was mapping different stuff. She also has cleaner AutoCAD. You can see Sal is like a, a pure energy 
a being of pure energy, Olivia is like an exacto blade. Just I think it was also because yeah. like I was not at the same. I was not at the chaotic table. I was at like you the, were sitting next to the professor. Yeah, and so I I couldn't get too much of what was going on at the mm-hmm. other table. So but this is still beautiful. <laughs> this is still also one of my one of my favorite ones. It's kind of minimalist and and beautiful. It's like pancake breakfast from the eighties. <laughs> I like it. And then these are pictures of what we're capable of making in the CNC machine. We didn't get a chance to do that this year, but we will. And then, hey, a little bit of design too. Close-up photography, that's a respectable image. So are those. Large text. I, I, would, have, yeah. I would have stepped the text down a little yeah. bit. It's very, for this project, I worked in a group. <laughs> also that hyphenation too. Yeah, yeah, oh, right? Yeah. Right here. Um, but check this out. This is a beautiful sequence, uh, a close-up photograph. This looks like it's just a studio I think background. This like a, can you scroll up? Yep. Oh, no, I didn't. I know I did something where like there was an actual photo of the Miller house from the same exact perspective, and I used to present them like right next to each other. Nice. Very nice. You know, well, I bet because this is your portfolio, I'm betting that maybe a Viz faculty might have said, like, show your work first. Yeah. Yeah. But it's nice to see all of these drawings, right? Some of them are early, some of them are later. These are different scales. And you can see these have been cleaned up. Mm-hmm. It's funny. I used the, uh, for the first years this year and teaching how to clean up drawings, I used that ex- same exact elevation and section drawing. <laughs> nice. Nice. Mondo. This is still one of Carol Herman's favorite Mondos ever. And the drawing was bad. <laughs> hey, nobody, nobody kicks butt on all parts of the Mondo. People either win at one or the other, but not all. And then this model survived for a long time. Photographs, little uh, computer drawing. It's amazing how some cropping and editing can make even a model that's about to fall apart look respectable. And I think that's really important. Um, a lot of reviewers during the first year review said, take a picture of your model right now. It's the best it's ever going to look. So these are really helpful to have. And those close-up images they, that reviewers don't get because they're either looking through the computer screen or they're looking through, they're, they're sitting away from it. It's really nice in a portfolio to get close up to those details that you like, and then just crop out the ones that you don't want people to see. Nice. Oh, that's the end. That's the end, Olivia. What do you think of your yeah. uh, first year Olivia project? I would say, because I have the D1 portfolio, which I'll bring it up, and like the D2 uh, and like Technics portfolio in comparison is just like, wow. And you know what? <laughs> and you know what? In class, we did, we did, we've done a little bit of that in studio and also in class, we've done that where it's like there's... N- there's actually nothing wrong with going back and looking at your old portfolios and giving yourself just a little bit of a hard time. Number one, you can see how much better you've, wow, how much yeah. better you've gotten, <laughs> right? Like in D1, we're just trying to get you guys to line up the stuff, right? right? Like, please just line it up with similar gaps, right? And in D1, everybody feels like they have to put a box around everything. Everybody feels like the title needs to be really, really bright and it needs to say, hold it light, you know? <laughs> and then in D2, you realize you don't need to do that. And then in D3, you realize that you can put computer stuff in there too. And then in D4, you can realize that like you've made a ton of stuff and you don't need to have it be about everything. So D1, I thought impact font was a good idea. Yes. D1, people love papyrus. They love... Uh, they love um, Comic Sans, and there is one case of Comic Sans out there, I know, and uh, it's totally allowed because it's part of the humor of the project. But, you know, a lot of people like like Black Adder or like Gothic or like there's some like high German fonts that are kind of out there. Not necessary. Like go with Times New Roman, go with a nice sans serif font, keep it simple, keep the focus on your work, not on not on the introduction of your work. Also, you guys should notice, oh, and thank you, Olivia's putting uh, links in issue to her current portfolio. And, um, and so again, if you're a first year student, what I would tell you to reflect on is how far you've come and who you are as a designer. 
Now for your Viz portfolio, not design studio, for your Viz portfolio, your professor has given you very specific, you know, what to include to kind of round you out as a designer and a person. And then you want to make sure that you represent all of your Viz projects in that portfolio. It kind of also serves as kind of a final assessment. So you don't just have, you can kind of clean off the, the fuzzy bits and kind of just show your best foot. Now, if you are a design for or a graduate student, we're asking you for a, a process book. Now, what that means is that you're not presenting stuff from D3. You're not presenting stuff from, from before. What you're doing is you're presenting this semester. Now, Olivia, I don't know whether you have like a process book for coup that you're working on or Sal, if you have one for stock. But a process We're book. We're just getting started on. You guys are just getting. <laughs> yeah. See, that's the thing. Process books. So portfolios kind of are a compendium of your history, and you always can kind of update it. A process book is a more of a short story of the semester. So it's a little harder to show examples of them because they're keyed into each semester. But for our D4 students or D2, if you're a grad student, unlimited pages needs to be in a PDF, eight and a half by eleven landscape because that's the most kind of flattering and easiest to lay out for architecture and imagery. And what you want to try to do is just kind of take a walk through the entire semester. And the benefit of that is that if you're in D4, we have everything up on Miro and you have a big collection of models, especially if you've been in person. So you want to kind of collect all of those and say, here's where I started. And you just kind of walk your way chronologically through. As your portfolio matures, it might not be presented in chronological order, but a process book is like, here's where I started. Here's this project. Here's this project. So the best way to lay out process book is to kind of show here's the final projects as kind of bookends to each of those projects. And then you want to collect things like sketches, feedback. If you, if you and your classmates were like making a mock-up model or took some photographs on the site that were really important to you, if you made a, uh, a model out of a bunch of like trash on your, on your desk and you took some pictures of it that were important that week, but you would never show them in a final review, that kind of stuff can go into a process book. And you can, and I absolutely believe that, like allowing there to be white space, allowing there to be empty blank space on the page allows us to spend time with the images. You don't have to spend lots of time describing it verbally. In a process book, it can be almost all visual with just some labels to keep it clear. And you're just kind of putting in your work. It's kind of almost like snapshots of your, your desk. But this year, our desk was both a real analog object and a digital space. Um, so for students in my spaces, in my learning spaces, I've told them that they can include like snapshots or screen grabs of the Miro board or Zoom sketches, because that was as much a part of the conversation as making sketches in our sketchbook. Yeah, here we go. So thanks, Olivia. So, so here's some examples of like showing how it's working out. Now, Olivia, this is your D10 project, right? Yeah, this is the, the, um, the process book from D9. From D9, so okay. The project, really. So this was a research heavy, right? So there's like lots of research, there's lots of maps and context that you guys were doing with Professor Ku. And likewise, if you were doing a process book and you were doing a lot of site research, let's say on East Park for people in, in second year undergrad, first year grad, you might be including your sketches, your mock-ups, your alternative concepts. And I wouldn't expect you to write as much as, uh, as an advanced student, student like Olivia is doing here, but the labels, and if you've already made those drawings that have labels on them, it's if you have time, if you're working on it this weekend, there's no reason to go in, to not go in and just clean up some of those drawings so they look a little bit nicer than what you might've had when you just needed to get it in for the day. But I would kind of work through it in a big, quick pass and then start to add detail and start to add detail and then have somebody else read it to make sure that it's in English and that it's spelled correctly. Because if you're anything like me, I spell horribly and I look at it and I'm like, yep, that's spelled right. And somebody's like, design definitely has an S and a G in it. So, and you can see that it's telling the story can you guys see in this process book that Olivia has, it's telling the story over and over again. So the images are far more redundant 
than they would be in a portfolio, right? In a portfolio, we would get tired of this and we'd be like, okay, Olivia, we get it, move on to the next project. But here it's telling the story of how the project evolved, how it changed, maybe even how it met with um, a dead end. And I know for this project, you guys, it was probably even more important to figure out how the inflatable facade didn't work than did work. There was no way to just dream it up and make it work. So, yeah, that's kind of where this individual concept came at the end of the D9 semester, where it was like, we don't think the ETFB, we don't have the budget for it. Yeah. So then we all came up with like our individual sort of concepts for the final. Yep. Um, not that mine, you know, 